various proteins that are in the cell. So it's a good idea to look not only where they are in the genome, as we discussed last time, but also take a look where might those uh, proteins be functioning within the entire cell. And normally, to do these host cell simulations, even though it'll be coarse grained, um, it takes it, the program that we'll be talking to you about, Lattice Microbes, was developed from the ground up primarily for use of the GPUs to give us the performance, the speeds, and be able to get to the size that are biologically relevant. So we want to get up to at least the size of a bacterial cell, yeast cell, and be able to simulate for an hour or more, a cell cycle. And as you all know, the time steps for uh, all atom simulations are nanoseconds. Um, so typically, we either run it on our own dedicated uh, set of GPUs. You can also run them at Blue Waters. Uh, it has a lot of GPUs available to it. Uh, and uh, we'll put another little symbol up here, which is the cloud. As I said, the only thing I warn you is that the cloud, as cool as it is, well, it does cost a little bit of money, but more importantly, they don't have the, always the best uh, GPUs available up there. All right, so we've been talking about these different approaches to modeling, and uh, we might want to step back and take a look at what sort of modeling we should use and, and base it on the kind of interactions that we're looking at uh, over space and over time. So here we have the angstroms into the atoms, subcellular structures, like with the virus and the chromatophore that you're looking at. Single cells, we're going to be talking about at least a micron, a few microns, and then if we start getting into colonies and populations, I'll show you one where you get up to a millimeter in size. So there are various approaches that are very good for uh, work in each of these areas. You do have to ask different questions. Uh, uh, so here are the atomic uh, uh, all-atom models. They are based on these potentials that you learned about it in the force field. So here could be DNA, and this could be a transcription protein interacting with it. Here's our friend the ribosome again. Uh, it's interacting with a protein. Uh, if you were to coarse grain that, then you might have, re have everything look like a rigid body, and you might think about doing some type of coarse grain Brownian dynamics simulation on that. But what I'm going to talk to you about is yet another method. It's called probabilistic based. We're going to worry about the state of the cell. And we'll worry about diffusion probabilities of things, say, to this object, the ribosome, or um, a reaction uh, of, say, a, a protein with the DNA. So the two words popped in is probabilities and also reactions. So you really don't talk about reactions very much in either of these methods. You're looking at Brownian dynamics, you're seeing changes in conformation, but unless you start coupling it with a quantum mechanical methodology to look at, say, bond breaking or making it an active site, you're really just looking at motions and conformational changes. Right? And each of these methods has its own time step, so femtoseconds, you're going to do Brownian dynamics and coarse grain methods. You lose a lot of the details, but you pick up in being able to have maybe bigger time steps. If you go over to here and use this methodology of probabilistic based, uh, it is called reaction diffusion master equation because we're going to write all the events in terms of uh, reaction diffusion, these probabilistic master equations, which I'll show you on the next slide. And um, our time steps are going to be microseconds, but that will allow you to get up to time scales of hours, and we're hoping that there'll be a little bit of an overlapping region here uh, that when we do a first sort of whole cell, a minimal cell simulation, uh, we, we laughingly say, well, we might be able to overlap for like about a, a microsecond uh, of the different methods to see how well they compare. The other thing I want to point out is when you do this RDME approach, you are taking the cell and dividing it up into subvolumes. And you, we will talk about reactions with each, within each of these subvolumes. If the cell has compartments, you could be having different reactions in each of the compartments, also in the membrane, in the nucleoid, if you're doing eukaryotic cells, in the mitochondria, in the cell nucleus. 
All right. So what is the reaction diffusion master equation? They said, we're interested in that oval, working problems in that range. OK, so um, we talk about the probability of the cell to be in a particular state. And the state we defined about what are the number, say, of messengers, of operators, of inducers, of proteins, whatever you have in your description of the system. And if it were really well stirred, and you didn't need the, to take into account this heterogeneity, no diffusion, then you would just write, well, the probability of that state, represented by x, to change with time is just equal to the sum over all the reactions that take you out of that state or bring you into that state. Now, hidden in these A's that are called propensities or the reaction uh, rates. Normally, you could think about trying to write down the reaction and changing from the concentrations to discrete particles, because this is a discrete method approach towards it. And the reason we, we chose this is because in the cell, you have some things that are there in small copy numbers. Like you typically have one or two genes that you're interested in. Um, but you might have thousands of proteins or, you know, what is it, uh, uh, millimolar of ATP. So you have the whole gamut of concentrations of particle numbers. If you don't take the discreteness into the considerations, then you won't see any fluctuations. You won't see any heterogeneity developing within the cell. And the one thing that we know from single molecule experiments that have done, that no two cells are ever alike. They can always have different number of proteins in them, different number of messengers, different RNA, even if they were grown from the same colony uh, initially. Uh, or, uh, and that just comes about because of the fact that gene expression is known to be stochastic. You have stochastic gene expression, that first step of just going from the DNA, the gene, getting into the protein. Different levels of messengers, different level of proteins, that's going to affect the overall behavior of the uh, metabolic network. So unfortunately, the cell is not well stirred. And the algorithm we use to simulate these is known as the Gillespie Stochastic Simulator. It's probably the most widely one that's used out there. But the cell is actually quite heterogeneous, right? There's a nucleoid region. Here you're seeing the gray dots or the ribosomes. Um, and uh, if you allow things to enter into the cell, uh, like this is a, uh, an analog of, uh, of a sugar, it's IPTG. Um, uh, You'll see enormous solutions of this, uh, and uh, say very few of the ribosomes. This looks like it has 3,000. And this is actually a really realistic picture. It's from a cryo-electron tomogram produced in the uh, laboratory of Wolfgang Baumeister and uh, his group leader, Ortiz. So they do a tomogram. This is in 3D. They can see all the ribosomes. They can see where the DNA is. They give us the architecture, the size of the cell. No two tomograms are alike, so this is one of the typical tomograms. And then you can get the rest of the crowding information, say, from proteomic studies. Uh, and what about the particles seem to be diffusing? Like if you have a membrane protein that's diffusing, or the ribosome should be diffusing. Those have been measured by these people who do single molecule experiments. They put labels on these things. And uh, like Johann Elf has measured the ribosome and then both the diffusion for the full ribosome and then the small and the large subunits as well. Um, these people work on RNA and Jamie Williamson from, um, uh, from Scripps helped us to develop a model that we could describe ribosome, ribosomal biogenesis starting with the gene, so we have transcription, translation, ribosome assembly, and then with Tom Kuhlman we've added to that model now uh, DNA replication. Uh, actually with him and with Tae Kip Ha, uh, DNA replication and uh, cell growth and cell division. So to these reaction terms, we have to add another little sum telling us, well, where does that reaction take place and what subvolume? And now you have diffusion of particles between those subvolumes. So this is just a fancy way of writing the diffusion terms in this equation, right? And I want to remind you the cell is really packed. If you put everything that's in there, 
it looks like, my God, where's the space? You have to take the slice and put it on its side. There's still a lot of space, but those orange dots would say be a typical protein count. And these would be all the other, uh, the green would be all the other proteins um, that are uh, making up the, the cell. So it's quite packed. All right, so um, what we try to do, what really motivated me years ago to start even the, these cell simulations, is I would look in science or nature and you'd see, oh, here's a slice through a cell, and you'd see this. And then you'd do, an, somebody else would do a slice through a cell, and you'd see that. And I go, are those two things consistent at all? Like, what's the rest of the cell look like? So it was from the very beginning designed to integrate theory and the experiments that are out there. You need a ton of experiments. You need information, say, about the packing and diffusion data. The SRI, that stands for super resolution imaging, because they can now track these particles. In fact, if you look at the Nobel Prize from two years ago, it was essentially given to those guys, like Murner at, Cal at uh, Stanford and Betsy and Stefan Hell in Germany because those guys track molecules uh, in the cell. You need something about the architecture, like that picture I showed you. That'd be cryo-electron tomography. You need omics data, and omics of everything. You have metabolomics, you can do RNA-seq data, you can do proteomics data. The big deal lately is before you used to get, get means of everything, but now they're able to take it on a single cell level and give you protein distributions across, say, 500 cells. And they've labeled almost every protein in yeast and every protein in, um, um, in E. coli. So that's a lot of information that's out there. So what about the reactions? Again, for the uh, model systems, there have been 20, 30 years of biochemistry done on them, where they've studied each of the reactions that's going on. Uh, Again, um, the, the getting some of the parameters, the kinetic parameters. Um, we have some single molecule data. There's a lot of other kinetics data that's also coming out of the biochemistry data. And I would even say now you can slowly get out of MD that you do on these smaller systems. Think about getting at least the docking information. That's another rate constant that one can use. So you have to be prepared to pull in everything. For the students, I've noticed the hardest thing is like, oh, I get two different answers. This lab says this and this lab does says that. They go, well, go read their papers and see who you trust more. <laughs> Take theirs, right? And it does become, uh, I jokingly say that, but there's a lot of truth to that. But it's also important, almost, it's been a very difficult uh, task, but I try to get my collaborators from these different areas to at least work on the same strain of E. coli, you know, and that has taken some, some effort, but they're slowly doing that. So for a couple of the model systems, same strain, you're getting consistent data. And then the next important thing is the growth media. Are they, like, if I asked you how fast does E. coli double, what would you answer? You have a typical idea? 40 minutes. 30 minutes. Anybody else? <laughs> okay, all of them are right. There you go, right? You feed it a lot of glucose and the so-called LB medium, which is not too well defined. You have to really look it up. In fact, they didn't even know the chemical breakdown of the yeast extract they gave them uh, uh, at times until just recently. So you see it everything from like 20 minutes to 120 minutes to three hours, right? Now, we tend to try and do all of our simulations on slow-growing E. coli, and part of the reason is the faster it grows, the more copies of the DNA you have in there. It goes through many cycles of replication. So as one biologist put it, fast-growing E. coli is born pregnant. It just has, there are a lot of uh, uh, copies uh, of the DNA in midstream there. So you try to, Pay attention that the data being collected is for the same strain under the same growth conditions. So you can put an integrative composite picture together. All right, so now if you have the reactions, then 
Uh, you can use our software Lattice Microbes uh, to simulate it. Um, it's best if you can use the multi-GPU code. That's the fastest. We have some statistics for you. You'll be running everything on the single GPU code. So that's why we curtail everything. And then, <coughs> at the moment, we don't have reaction parameters for every reaction in the cell. We're getting there. But <coughs> you, at least for the model systems, they've written down the reactions. They might not have the kinetic parameters. So what you can do is sort of mix dynamics with the steady state fluxes through portions of the network. That you can do. That is the whole field of getting those steady state fluxes. It's called flux balance analysis. So you can mix dynamics and kinetics with steady state. And I'll show you some examples where you almost have to do that when you start looking at millions of cells. Right? So you can calculate their, how their local environment changes, the diffusion of the metabolites, how that affects the uptake into the cells, and then use snapshots of the steady state behavior, feed it back in what gets secreted, change the local environment, and do this, you know, a hundred thousand or a million times, and you can see how the colony changes. So these are some of the systems. Uh, these are the uh, E. coli and yeast or the model systems. This is the one that was just published by the Greg Venter Institute. It's a minimal cell. We're now also applying this onto stem cells and as well as to uh, one of the methanogens we mentioned earlier. And mixing those methods, the kinetic reaction diffusion with these steady state methods, that's how you, as I said, you do the cells, the cell colonies. Okay, um, let's go on. So again, if you're interested in various aspects of the, the code, either the FBA part, the flux balance analysis, um, uh, applying them both to E. coli and to the cell. Uh, we have a paper that's out in 2013 that, and then one that we have just submitted on, on yeast. Um, to do that time separation I talked about between kinetics and steady state, we first published that, I think, in this book chapter on computational systems biology, and then in this Nobel symposium on uh, going from single cells to colonies. Um, you're lucky that you have our main programmer here, is Mike Halleck, because he works with all the state-of-the-art GPUs to improve the code, um, how to do it in parallel computing, and then how to even improve some of the algorithms that was just published. And then we talked a little bit about this metabolic reprogramming as you get into colonies, because the cells will change dramatically depending on their location in the colony. So the guys in the center of the colony will not see much oxygen. The ones on the outside will. And they'll have totally different growth behavior. And then as far as getting up to doing one whole cell completely, it's these set of papers that have just gone on since 2014 until just this year, is we're doing ribosome biogenesis. And uh, we've also added into it, as I said, the DNA replication. and uh, and some of the work that we're doing here is now being also applied to look at the small RNAs and, and their kinetics within the cell. So the program that you're using, Lattice Microbes, at least when we tested it in 2013, I don't even see that reference up there. I think I just started with 2014 here. Um, it was about 300 times faster than any other code that was out there. And uh, as I said, if you're running a multi-GPU version, that is, of course, the best and almost absolutely necessary to do yeast as you get up with the bigger systems. OK, so some of the major advancements that went on in the code. And you now you're seeing a sort of a little movie here of the E. coli cell undergoing ribosome biogenesis. It has, you see the clock ticking here, it has a two-hour doubling time. And so the cell is growing, growing, growing. You're seeing various intermediates in the ribosome assembly. Some of the red, uh, it has seven operons for our RNA. The proteins, have, they're, they're located in operons. And then the uh, uh, purple are the mRNA. 
and it'll cycle through a couple times. So that was just recently published. And why we were able to do that, we started off just with a very simple model of ribosome biogenesis, working with experimentalists to get the rate constants for that. So Jamie Williamson, Jamie Williamson at Scripps has dedicated his whole life to looking at in vitro ribosome assembly. And we took a lot of his pulse chase experiments, worked with him to develop a kinetic model that we could then transfer into the cell simulation. When we did the, with that, we didn't let the cell grow. We just put in a dilution rate to accommodate the fact that it grows and then divides. But in the meantime, we were working with the people who do super resolution imaging, and they actually could start labeling messengers inside of a cell and saw that that changed with time. So here's time, and, and this is a cell that has a doubling time, say, of 70 minutes. And the messengers, uh, depending on where that gene is located on the circular DNA, uh, say at this time TR, you'll have a second copy. So you, if you had this much messenger before, now you have this much after the gene has been copied. This is, of course, assuming both genes, the original and the copy, are functioning. In most of the cases, that's true, unless there's, uh, there have been a few cases measured uh, where maybe the second copy does not produce at quite the same rate. But in our assumptions in, in handling these models, we assume that they both are then active. Now, the idea that you had to account for a change in the messenger during the cell cycle is not new. Everybody realized that they just didn't know what to do about it. So there was an interesting article uh, in Science, uh, I think published at the end of 2014, uh, where folks at Caltech said, well, look, you go from a low state to a high state, let's just take the average of those two and fit all the data. That's got to be a first good approximation. It's not too bad, but there is this inner, there's this region too where you're changing from a state of low copy number to high copy number. And it turns out, depending where that gene is located on the DNA, not taking that into consideration can really give you a bad model fit to your measurements. So they're measuring the messenger distribution. What do you want out of that? You want kinetic data. You want to know, get, can I fit a transcription time to that? Can I uh, uh, fit a decay time? So you want to be able to have the best fit to those messenger distributions. So we'll show you how you can do that. And if taking the time-dependent decay into, uh, uh, into account, you can get very, very good fits. OK, so those are, I think, the two or three projects I want to talk to you about. Um, this is now one of the first simulations that was ever done on the lattice microbes. And we chose to do the LAC genetic switch, because as anybody will tell you coming from biology, this is one of the most studied systems out there. And we thought we would just take the kinetic parameters and put it onto the GPU and show, you know, measure how much time it would take to do it. Ugh. It didn't, nothing turns out to be that simple. Because it turns out, people who developed this on some of the kinetic parameters, the people who knew proteins didn't know RNA very well, and vice versa. So uh, when we tried running it and comparing it to some single molecule experiments that had been done by Sunny Shi at Harvard, we couldn't get any agreement. So we started to look a little bit more systematically into it, look where the kinetic parameters came from, and so those of you who don't know the LAC genetic switch, here you have a cell. Uh, right now on this gene, the LAC gene is sitting a repressor. It can have a few binding sites for a sugar. Now this system has been designed so it has, uh, takes up this IPTG which is not metabolized in the system like a normal sugar would be. So if you have one sugar bind to it or two sugars, that will influence the rate at which the uh, repressor comes off the operator. So here's one sugar, two sugars, right? So there's a forward and a backward rate to each of these things. So what happens when the repressor falls off? The gene starts being expressed. There are ribosomes here, the little orange balls the, labeled the large and the small subunit. They will go and start being translated. 
into proteins. And what are those proteins? What are they? They are proteins that are on the membrane. And what do they do? They allow more of the sugar in. So this can be, that's why they call it a lactogenetic switch. Once you get enough of these proteins on the membrane and it's shuffling in this sugar, all of a sudden it'll switch over and it'll just let a ton of the stuff in. And what Sonny Shi did, this fellow doing single molecule studies, he labeled, put a little yellow fluorescent label next to that gene, so when it appeared on the membrane, he could count it. Right? And he did it at various studies, uh, various concentrations of the inducer in the surrounding environment. So these set of equations are a very simplified version of just what I told you. So as I said, you have the repressor binding to this operator here. You have the operator making messenger. You have the messenger going through translation and giving you a protein and leaving the messenger intact. And then both the messenger and the protein can decay. Uh, what about getting the sugar into the cell here? Well, um, or that's down here, excuse me. Uh, this is just the sugar interacting with the repressor here. You can have it binding to the lac with no sugars, with one sugar, reverse reactions connected to those. And then getting the inducer into the cell, you can have both passive, which are the first two, so it's the same backwards and forward, or these, these ion channels here, these permeases, can actually undergo active transport, so you can take that into account as well. So that's about 25 reactions. I think it's 11 different species are in there. We have the rate constants for everything, plus you have the diffusion coefficients have also been measured by people doing single molecule. So before we started the calculation, we wanted to take a look at how things might change just because of the crowding. So here's a real simple uh, simulation that we did on one of the first ones on the GPU. This is one of my colleagues from CS. His name is Wenmei Wu. Uh, this was part of Elijah's uh, PhD project. We have a little bit of the DNA here, and the repressor is sitting on the DNA, on the operon there. And these are ribosomes uh, that might be nearby. And of course, it's not only ribosome, they're proteins as, whoop, as well. So they'll pop in. They'll be. Uh, all goes well. They'll be green and greener. Uh, we've got them a bunch of different classes. But if I leave them there, you can't see anything. So I take them out, and now the repressor comes off the gene. It diffuses around. Most of the time, it will escape, right? And you'll have to wait to uh, a repressor. There's a, on average about 10 to 15 of them in the cell. Comes from someplace else and binds there. This one actually rebinds. So if you look at the probability of rebinding here, and you change the packing fraction, you'll see the probability goes up if you change the packing. Right? So we tried to get a, a rough idea of what's going to all these rates that are in the literature. Do we need to change them? Are we in the realm of possibilities? So uh, we left those. That wasn't the main problem. The main problem. Uh, comes later, as I'll show you, and that had to do with how many proteins can one messenger make. And uh, somebody took the, the, the data from the switched copy, where you go from maybe a basal amount of, say, 10 of those permeases to 2,000, and said, well, on average, if I go back to this model here, uh, where do you get information about the messenger? Well, you get those out of single molecule experiments. Fish, they, they measure how many messengers are there. So maybe there's on average 10. So they took 10 into 2,000 and said, each messenger makes 200 proteins. If you put that kinetic rate in there, you don't get agreement. And uh, so uh, what they <coughs> didn't take into account was the fact that the messenger and the protein have two totally different decay rates. The messenger doesn't stay around for very long, and the protein does. In our hands, the only way to get rid of the protein is to have the cell divide. We use dilution as the ultimate uh, decay rate. That's also not quite right, but it's not like the one to two to three, four minutes that the messenger has. So if you don't get that right, 
then your whole kinetics are off to the model. So we learned a lot in doing this. So let's go on to the next one. So one of the things we wanted to do is use VMD to look into the cell. Uh, and so again, same nomenclature here. The ribosomes are in orange. There are these large complexes and small protein complexes. And now hopefully this works. So let's say the cell had, this is a fast growing cell. It could have anywhere from 40 to 80,000 uh, ribosomes in it. And you pack it fill with the rest of the stuff from the proteomics data. And now let's just zoom in on one little section of the cytoplasm and try to look at how much space is available. So the, with those sublattice sites, uh, we're going to measure how many of them, so there were 16 nanometers in, in size, how many of them are full, or half full. So start measuring away. And when we did the first calculation, we felt the diffusion coefficients of the ribosomes were so much slower than everything else. We placed them either from the tomogram or from, if we didn't know, we, we placed them uh, you know, randomly, kept them fixed, and then followed the reactions through the rest of the cell. So it looks like a wafer, right? A lot of holes in it. OK, so now we're ready. To, we sort of have a feel for the parameters. We uh, took into account that the messenger actually only makes a couple proteins, not 200 proteins. Put that model in, and now we compared it to Sonny Shi's data. So here uh, is his picture. Uh, he's labeled, as I said, the permeases. And even the ones that look dark, they're in the basal st state. They haven't turned on like these. These are the ones with 2,000 proteins on the membrane. Shuffled in so much sugar, you've made so many proteins, they look like yellow coffee beans. But these still always have a basal amount of them. And it's anywhere from like 10 to like almost 100 before it gets, it's on the threshold to switch over. Uh, the switching at this particular concentration of the uh, IPTG starts turning on in about 30 uh, to 50 minutes. All right, so in our hands, we gave each bacteria its own little GPU and started the simulations. And we started them in their basal amount. <coughs> um, and, and, oh well, um, and you'll see some of the cells. You see these little blips of red here. Those are the messengers being formed. And there's some cells that are very active. Those are the ones that had a little bit higher level of the messenger, uh, excuse me, of the permease already in them. So we started off with a whole distribution. Um, and at the end of the simulation, which went on for 58 minutes, you can see these two cells really turned on. They have a lot of yellow on them. These are back sort of in their basal state. This one's in the process of switching from having low to very high concentrations. And this was roughly in the time course that he saw. And the fraction of the cells, we got roughly uh, out of those six cells, about a third of them should turn on, so you should get about two of them. So we felt we had a very, very good model. Uh, those were for fast growing. We also did it for slow growing. Here we had even more precise information from the tomograms where the ribosome should be. We s put the gene here, and you can see it's being switched on and off. The red is always the messenger that's being formed. And uh, we started to look at how long does a repressor stay on the operator. And we saw a correlation with the size of the cell because it also dramatically shifts the volume. And that affects then the rebinding. It's like the packing, if you want, uh, of what's going on there. And so these slow-growing cells, they tend to be long and skinny. The fast-growing cells are shorter and very fat, right? Uh, so, uh, and on the bottom, I guess it didn't, why didn't it run? Whoa, all right. Uh, I'll go back here. Um, I don't know, hmm. let me try one more time. It looks like the movie's there. Hmm. Oh, there it goes. So uh, the only th difference between the movie down here and up here 
I've taken away the ribosomes so you can see the repressors. They're in various shades of blue, depending on whether they have zero, one, or two sugars on them. So when you do cell simulations, it's just like you know how water obscures everything when you're doing the MD simulation. You have to take it away or make it some transparent color so you can see what's going on. We got the same problem, right? Uh, in our case, oh god, it's the ribosomes are in the way. So you have to be able to go in and concentrate on what aspect you want to see of this. And depending on who you show this to, and some people want to know, well, uh, how often do those repressors go through the nucleoid region? We never looked. It turns out in E. coli, yes. And that's been seen both in the tomograms um, as well as, hmm, I guess I took that picture out. Just a second. Uh, it's, that's the cool thing. It's been measured now twice. Um, the, the, what I'm showing you are the ones from the, um, from the cryo-electron tomograms from Baumeister. But Sunny, she labeled a ribosomal protein and they saw the same behavior. But I will only say for E. coli. I'm not sure if it's going to be the same in all other bacteria. So the other ones that have been studied rather well is Calobacter, because it has an asymmetric cell division. Were they having reasons for this? Um, yeah, uh, that's interesting. Uh, yes, there seems to be some general reason. So if, for measuring the diffusion coefficients of the subunits as well as the full ribosome, it just seems to be excluded from the nucleoid region. The DNA seems to be more condensed for larger periods of time in the E. coli. From what I can see, from, there is one tomogram that's been done on Calobacter. There seems to be some big vacuole that's sitting at one end of it. Maybe that's forcing it. I'm, I'm not sure. They haven't really studied it. On our simulations, it'll come out that way. If you have a different diffusion coefficient for it inside that it gets excluded, then it'll naturally go and try to fill up the sides. And that's where the biggest space is. Because you can see from the tomogram that the, uh, that the, uh, the nucleoid sort of, it's, the E. coli almost looks like a cylinder and two caps. And the nuclear region only goes over, over the cylinder region, right? Somehow I, I, I had the tomograms in the PowerPoint presentation. This is the keynote presentation. I think I just didn't copy them over, so I apologize. Uh, I mean the raw tomograms so that you can see them, right? So one of the things we wanted to figure out was uh, uh, having worked with Carl Vose, um, is could we explain, you know, why you got that distribution uh, that you see, and how long would it take the assembly? What does the whole kinetics have to do with that overall distribution that you see? Uh, we were lucky. This was a perfect time to be interested in this because not only from Carl did we have the sequences, but because of the other Nobel Prize in Chemistry, I think it was like 2005. No, how long ago was that? Maybe eight. They, they got the Nobel Prize for the ribosome. So we knew a lot about the structures. And the assembly of the ribosome has been studied since about 1977. And there was a group in Japan that really did some of the first studies of how do the proteins and the RNA come together to assemble this. So we started to look at it with more modern methods, first with somebody doing single molecule experiments, this Teke Pa. And we looked at the assembly of just the beginning part of the ribosome, of the 16S. Then later on, we worked in with Jamie Williamson and looked at the entire uh, uh, system being formed. So what we did, and let's just look now at the small subunit. So the yellow uh, is the rRNA. And here are all the proteins, about 20 of them, that have to assemble onto it. And if they all assembled, you know, uh, at once or were competing with one another, you could, in principle, have two to the 20th states of intermediates. But 
as I said, uh, since already the 1970s, we know that it's a hierarchical assembly, that some of these proteins bind directly to the uh, RNA. They're the so-called primary proteins. And then there are others that cannot bind until these have already been bound. And there are still others that cannot bind until the primary and the secondary are done. So it's called a hierarchical assembly. And it turns out it's not uniform across the RNA. These bind first, and then it goes more or less five prime central, three prime domain. And so what that is telling you, if you're looking here, starting off with the naked RNA and you start adding proteins, not every one can be added. That one can't be. That eliminates these. So you can dramatically switch that down to 1,600 states by taking this hierarchical assembly into account. And as I said, one way to do this is through a bunch of pulse chase experiments. <coughs> um, there should be a picture of this, where you come in and you add uh, uh, labeled proteins at different times. And then you can get an idea, when do I start seeing C3 being bound? When do I see C4? When do I see the protein C20 being bound? So you can take that information, fit it, and then that's are the rate constants that we use for our kinetic model. Now, 1600, at the time that we did our simulations, was still a bit much for us to handle. We wanted to get it to a smaller number, uh, 145. So here are the dots of the experiments. So we kept cutting away intermediates until we could get it down to a small enough number to put in. Because remember, we still have to do transcription. This is just the assembly part. It's going to take about 1,300 reactions and 251 species to do everything. So it looked like it did a pretty good fit uh, with the green. And that's the model that we went with. And here's the assembly map that you get. So here's starting with the naked RNA. And here's ending with one of the subunits. And you have these numbers here just refer to those 145 intermediates. And the strength of the lines connecting them is just how much of the flux in the assembly goes through that path versus, say, something that's a little smaller. And you can see a lot of it goes through this position here for 004, and that's the S4. And that's also been known from other single molecule experiments that that sort of nucleates the formation of the RNA. So again, very much tied the kinetic models to experimental information. And it seemed to be reproduced in the kinetics. There does seem to be sort of all paths sort of run through this one state here. It looks almost like a bottleneck. Then that's where you go back and look at the ribosome with all the primary and the secondary proteins there in the first two domains. You can look at it through MD and try to figure out why is that a kinetic bo bottleneck? What has to move in order to do the next steps of assembly? And that's another thing that we did in that paper. So you did a com combination of MD and the whole cell uh, simulations. So when you're done, you write down a kinetic model. Um, it's going to have about 1,300 reactions. I said 251 species. So this assembly part, that's a summary of those diagrams I just showed you. Uh, everything can degrade. You'll have transcription, turning the uh, genes for the proteins into messengers, and the genes for the RNA into uh, the operons for the uh, rRNA into the 16S or 15 or the 23S, so on and so forth. Then you have translation, so the messenger binds to the 30S, you form the full assembly, and then you read the protein, and then it falls apart. Now, this whole translation step, that's going to depend on the length of the mRNA and how many proteins are in there. And then everything that's in, every species has to have its own diffusion coefficient. And again, we're lucky, uh, just about a year ago, Johan Elf measured all the diffusion coefficients for the ribosome, so that was very useful. So here's a little sort of uh, illustration of how the model works. As I said, we're going to use a lattice size of 32 nanometers. And let's appear inside of the reaction box. There's the cell, it's inside and outside. Looks like a Lego but cell, right? Uh, it's about four microns long, and it's about uh, not quite a micron across. 
And now I'm showing you some of the operons. The red ones are the rRNA operons. Remember, this has seven. They're dispersed at various places along the circular DNA. And it also has about eight or nine ribosomal operons. All right, and now we're going to follow the steps through that kinetic scheme I showed you. We'll start with the formation of the messenger from one of the operons. There it is. And now what can that messenger do? Well, all of them can do this too, but it will diffuse. Okay. And then it should bind to the small subunit. And now that should combine with the large subunit. And it's ready to start translating the messenger, which I show you up at the top. So it works its way through. Every time it forms a protein, it gets produced, forms another, and then when it's through the operon, everything falls apart. Now, good, we got the proteins made. Let's look at one of the red operons for the rRNA. Let's make the 16S from it. And now you have to start the assembly process, which we showed you. So uh, the proteins have to bind to it, and as it binds to it, it changes color until it turns into the small subunit, which is blue. So as I said, this is a, a blender movie. So we, the, the time steps are about proportional what they are. We had to speed it up uh, to show some things. But the assembly part is much faster than, of course, than uh, the diffusion uh, parts for some of the, the large subunits and small subunits. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, I think you're asking, is there, all right, so we just assign a diffusion coefficient to them, right? Do they sense electrostatics from the other one? No, they don't. That's represented in the kinetics for the binding to it, or the protein assembly part. So in fitting the data to Williamson, the fact that you know, the RNA has got a large negative charge to it, and the proteins have a huge opposite sign to them. That affects the overall rate constants. So that's all we take into a part. We do not have, you're thinking, maybe nonspecific binding into this model, right? Um, we just have diffusion and then the reactions of binding set by the experiment. So you can look at the overall results, uh, what gets produced over the 120 minutes. So there's a lot going on in here. The main thing to see is the total number of ribosomes goes from about 3,000, which is more or less what they saw in the tomograms, as well as Sonny's uh, experiments of, of labeling a, a ribosomal protein. So over the course of time, it doubles from 3,000 to 6,000. Um, the small number here, are the uh, intermediates. There's never more than about 10 of them. So they come and go very quickly. They're made and then they bind. And then we had started off, we turned off uh, uh, the ribosome so we could, we made a different label so we could watch them grow here, the small subunit, and uh, just see how quickly they're even formed. Because there were some measurements out that in vitro, the assembly can take up to 10 minutes to 20 minutes. In the cell, it goes on in less than a minute. And we wanted to see if we got the rate right. So we would take the, the derivative of that, and we got approximately the right rate of the formation. OK, now what did we do wrong? Um, well, there's several things. I could give another whole lecture on that. We had every ribosomal operon emitting at the same rate. Uh, that's not quite right. And the other thing was, even our ribosome numbers, when we started to compare it to you know, other experiments, we felt we were underestimating some of the, the proteins that were there <coughs> account. And that's because we didn't take into account the gene duplication. So if this is the origin, and let's say you had one of the ribosomal operons or one of the ribosomal protein operons in this position, after a certain time through, you're going to have two copies of this gene. 
So now you should be having twice as many messengers, and that could, you know, give you more proteins of that kind, or uh, so we could underestimate this thing, depending on where those operons are sitting. And the fact that they were measuring two copies in this case is seen through these plots here that the collaborator had labeled them. Uh, so you could see the operon. This cell has really two of them. This has two, this has two, this has two, this has two. And then he counted how many of them had one copy, how many of them had two copies. You know, it's like uh, 100 to about 160. So we really should take DNA replication into account. We saw that again from collaborations with another single molecule colleague, uh, Tae Kye Pa and Jin Yi Fei. They didn't measure anything to do with translation. They measured messengers that had to do with metabolism. So for those of you who know metabolism, PTSG is one of the glucose transporters. It's the one at the top of the glycolysis pathway that brings in the sugars into the cell. So they measured the messengers for PTSG plus a protein, another RNA, a small RNA that regulates this. It's not so interesting for this story, but let me just tell you, that's the messenger distribution they saw for PTSG. And try as we would, we cannot fit it with the standard uh, chemical master equation that we wrote down in that second slide, like the reaction of gene gives a messenger, messenger can decay or you know, make protein, try to solve this thing. We never could get the width of this correct, right? So until we wrote down this. First gene gives messenger, second gene gives messenger, and then everybody can decay. So we're back to this picture here, right? And when we took that into consideration, it turns out if it's very simple gene expression, we could even solve for it analytically, but we definitely could always simulate it using the chemical master equation that is in the lattice microbe software. And here's the fit. This was one that was measured by in the science paper, so Rob Phillips was generously sent us his, his data, that's the histograms. This was their fit, because remember, what they did was to take uh, just an average of the two peaks, and so that's why it looks bimoidal. We took into account the full range uh, and the time dependence of the mRNA distribution, and then the red fit is what we get. So getting a better fit gives you better estimates of the transcription parameters and the decay parameters. And we did it not only for the ones that are constitutively expressed, but also, that, which is the case we had here, but also those ones that are regulated. So the gene can go off and on, and then it's in its on state, makes the messenger. And again, this is our green, is the fit to the experimental data. This is if the red would be a fit if you tried to assume well, I didn't know it was regulated. I'm going to fit it uh, with a constitutive theory, right? So I, I just bring this to make a point. You can have the experimental data, but if the idea is to take the data and turn it into parameters, you have to simulate it correctly or have a better theory for it, or you're not going to get appropriate values for KT and K off and K on. All right, so let's back, go back to ribosome biogenesis. Again, we were lucky because a colleague named Tom Kuhlman had actually labeled genes systematically around the whole circular DNA. Here's the origin, here's the terminus, so he, he did them like I think four or five on each side. And with a fluorescent label, so we could watch when did we start seeing one copy or two copies. And here's for a gene that's close to the origin. So it appeared pretty soon. Then here's one that's a little bit further away, appeared a bit later, the second copies. And here's one that's closer to the terminus, and that's even further away. And we also had the cell sizes. So we could turn that information in and get idea about those parameters to be using for DNA replication for these 120 minute growing cells. So there had been estimates already what those replication time should be, but they'd only been done on cells that were in that 20 to 60 minute doubling period. And going to 120 minutes, people knew that it changed. There were a few isolated experiments. 
So we took Tom's data for those 120 minute growing, and this was our first estimate um, to get at the initiation time, the period uh, you know, after cell division, when do you start replicating the DNA, and then how long before the cell divides. So these are estimates that we came up with. We put them into the model, and that's the result. That's the picture that you're seeing. So now we let the DNA replicate at the times that we have there. <coughs> and um, and let it grow according to those rates that we have from fitting of Tom Kuhlman's data. Um, he did it for purposes of the simulation. So it's like, uh, grew it out in that direction. This has since been redone because we went back and reanalyzed the data a bit more. So the initiation time changed a bit uh, for there because it's really hard. As you see these cells getting near the cell division, uh, he was throwing away everything that looked like it was about ready to pinch off. But it turns out it takes some time for it to really do this. And if you get the statistics right with the length distributions being measured, you have to include more of those cells. So what he has now, the thing grows. Here's the cell, and it grows this way. And unless it's, there's some reason, like you put it into something, it's one of these mother machines where it's growing, the cells get, that divide get pushed upwards. There's no directionality imposed into them, if you think of this as in, in a solution. Right. So then we let them grow uh, left and right equally. Now, how long did those simulations take? Whoops. Um, uh, so these are some tables that were done by um, Mike Halleck. So they're benchmarks, so you always have to ask what's in the benchmark. So you, uh, either you do it by systems, which is sort of what Juan was showing you. Here's the chromatophore with seven, you know, with uh, 80 million. Here's a, a virus with 100 million. Or you just do a number, fixed number of reactions and then change systematically the, the volumes in them. These were done with a fixed number of reactions or fixed reaction types. But still, you get the idea that it does a lot of change depending on what GPUs you use here. Right? And so what you're seeing at the bottom is a simulation volume. And on the vertical axis is the days that we need on a computer to simulate one hour of a cell. So when we started off with that first very simple reaction of the LAC genetic switch, um, that was taking us about a day or more um, uh, just to do those 25 reactions, right? And you could speed things up depending on the lattice size you used, whether it was 16 or 18 and then the time step that you had. Now, when we went over to these faster uh, GPUs, the whole set of curves just moved down dramatically. But, and then if you go and do the ribosome biogenesis with the 32 nanometer, it falls even further. So. Uh, this would be where the dividing cell would be. This would be where yeast is. So if you look at what I just showed you, that two-hour doubling cycle uh, with about a 1,300 reactions, 251 species, it takes now just a day on the uh, Titan X's. It running, we're running here uh, CUDA 7.0 or 7.5. So you can do the entire translational replication uh, assembly network in a day on, on these GPUs. All right, now, um, great. We've got really the replication, translation networks under control. The thing is, we didn't have much, if any, of the metabolic network there. And this is a diagram, a Voronoid diagram, of the proteins that are in the cell. So you can see about half of them are involved in replication and translation, but another half of the proteins are involved in enzymatic reactions, right? So those are still to be, a full picture has to be added. So what we do at the moment is we do this time scale separations where we solve the metabolic part uh, in the steady state and use the information from that, its growth, 
as well as what gets secreted uh, to inform the reaction diffusion reaction going on inside of the cell. So here we're going to concentrate on trying to merge or uh, the changing microenvironment and how that affects the metabolic response of cells sitting here versus here versus over here. So this metabolic map has been really well studied. Uh, uh, we have there to thank Bernard Paulson, uh, who keeps uh, improving this map, but it's now been steady for a couple of years. So you can take up glucose, you can take up oxygen, then you're really interested in what gets secreted here. Are you also looking at the permeation? Did that already. Um, so what I'll show you very quickly is um, how we solve that problem. So uh, I didn't put that part of the lecture in there. Uh, we're just looking at steady state behavior of these metabolic networks. This is just a cartoon for it. There, um, so let me instead just back up. So what we're going to do is really try to reproduce that experiment. And so we have Arger, and we did both a calculation as well as the experiments. So uh, the Arger has uh, M9 solution in there, some trace metals, this amount of glucose. You stripe a single cell on there, and it grows, and you watch it grow over 30 to 40 hours. In the meantime, you're looking at and calculating what's the diffusion of all the metabolites that are in the system. And because we have worked with this system before, we know what E. coli can take up. That's based on what you put in here and what it can secrete. So um, we start with the description. We let it diffuse. If you look at a cell, say, in this lattice site, and now these lattices are 10 microns. They're no longer 32 microns. So each lattice site has a number of cells in it. And we look, well, there's so much oxygen in that cell or so much glucose in that subcell. That's going to affect the uptake rate of glucose into here. And that, in turn, is going to affect whether it gets glucose or oxygen, whether it goes off and uses the TCA cycle, makes CO2, or whether it makes uh, and secretes acetate. So you use that information. You calculate the growth and what gets secreted. Use that growth rate to uh, change the pattern of cell growth. So if it's growing, then that growth rate tells us, do we need to start moving cells into the neighboring sublattice site? Um, and then knowing what's secreted, that changes the local uh, concentrations and therefore the whole diffusion process. So you keep on doing this. The time step here is in milliseconds, so you can calculate yourself how many thousands of times, millions of times this is done to go over 30 hours. And now you can compare the growth of your colony computationally to what you observe under the microscope. So here's the colony diameter, and here's the colony height. And you have three different numbers here, because in converting the growth to the packing of those cells in a, in a lattice space, we weren't sh sure if we should start letting them move into the neighboring cells if it was 80% packed or 65 or half packed. Right? There are, so we did all three. I think at the end of the day, it's the, I think it's the 65 is perhaps the best. And these various uh, solid forms here uh, refer to different time points. And we also labeled a bunch of different promoters at different pathways in the cell, because we were interested in how the cell utilizes oxygen, how it utilizes glucose, and how it uh, secretes acetate. So just to give you a feel for, uh, from the calculations, it's easier to see. Here's the oxygen concentration. This is after 12 hours, 13, and 14 hours. Initially, everything is pretty well oxygenated. Air, the colony, the agar. Then with, as time increases, the cells in the center see less and less oxygen. If you go here and look at glucose, well, of course, there's nothing in the air initially. It's all in the agar and distributed into the cell. But again, with increasing time, the co glucose concentration becomes much less at the top of the colony and is only substantially there at the bottom of the colony. And to do these experiments, you have to get a lot of labeled 
uh, strains. So each one of these represents a different strain. And we were very lucky. Yuri Alon in Israel gave us uh, one of them, or two of them, and the others we could do ourselves. And this is what you observe after about 30 to 40 hours of growth. You have a two-colored plasmid that you put into the system. One is labeled with M-cherry. That shows you every time the promoter for the PTSG, the glucose pathway, is turned off. And one that's labeled with green, uh, fluorescent protein, to show you whenever the acetate pathway is activated. So computationally, you would say after 34 hours, 30 to 40 hours, you should see something that looks like this. There would be a layer of green at the top when you shine light on it, and a layer of red at the bottom. And then you can come with a structured illumination microscope and take various slices, say close to the agar or very high uh, away from the agar interface. And you would expect up here, you should only see these green dots. And then this is a slice through the side, um, you know, perpendicular to it. And again, you see green at the top, red at the bottom. As you move closer and closer to the agar, the green disappears and you only start picking up this red that's right down here. At this point, you sort of see this outer ring here. And that was the validation of the experiments. Now, somebody asked me, or sort of just to repeat it again, um, so you put in the, the two colored plasmid, and you see the colonies near the top. They're glucose starved, and they start consuming acetate. And the ones at the bottom, uh, they consume glucose and they produce the acetate. So the guys, they eat it at the top, they produce it at the bottom. Right? So that is like, uh, that is really driving this metabolic differentiation. It's called, in, uh, in biologists refer to this as metabolic cross-feeding. And to give you an example, out of human cells, you have a very similar type of scenario. It's called lactate cross-feeding. Here you have the blood vessel and um, so the cells that are f further away here, uh, they're consuming glucose and they produce lactate. And then the oxygenated cells, um, they all consume uh, the lactate over glucose and they'll grow. So what they came up with is this ingenious idea to block acetate production and that will cause these cells up here to die, right? So what they do is they said they target uh, this, I think it's MCT1 inhibition um, uh, here. And after a while, they uh, see that the cells died. And as far as I know, this has just recently been patented as uh, one of the tools to fight cancer for lung and colon rectal and uh, cervical cancer. Okay, so now with an eye towards the tutorials, um, as I said, when we do our lattice uh, microbe simulations, um, we use everything we can get our hands on, uh, and that includes blue waters, which is at N uh, NCSA at the University of Illinois. Uh, we also have a center, um, an NSF center for the physics of living cells, it's called CPLC. We have a small GPU cluster there. It's, it's from Cirrus scale. Um, and for you guys today, what we've done is we've purchased for each of you a node on this uh, Amazon cloud. Uh, we will only run it till like 6 o'clock, and then Mike will turn everything off because you have to pay, it's like 65 cents an hour. We wanted to book it for you guys, so because if you do it, like in the negotiating stage, you say, well, I don't want to pay a fixed amount. Uh, and you can look at what the costs are running and go, oh, I'll take the ones in Virginia uh, that are running at, you know, 25 cents an hour. The thing is they can throw you off if somebody else comes along and is willing to pay more and kick you off. So if you want to run it, please run it today. Right? Try the exercises because we, we will only run this thing until 6 o'clock and then the guys have to turn it off, okay? And so we'll be running it on the, on the, on the cloud there. And um, 
In the afternoon, we'll start off the session with, I'll have Mike Halleck tell you a little bit about the cloud computing. Have, have any of you done it before? It's really cool, I have to say. You know, uh, if the people have the stuff up there running, I wouldn't, I don't, for my research, I wouldn't do it because it's just not good enough equipment up there uh, in the cloud. But to get an idea of what's going on, I, I think this is going to become more and more the mode of training people, right? Because we don't have to worry about getting our, either getting you accounts on Blue Waters or people would come and maybe you have an NVIDIA card in your thing, but you have some other graphics card. So we could never have people all set up the same. Same way with those computers there. Half the time they weren't set up right. So this way we just, Mike made the image up on their machines. We did this back in Urbana and now you all can just run it, which is really a very cool thing. So uh, we'll go through some of the exercises, some simple A plus B gives you C types of reaction, solve them uh, with standard ordinary differential equations like you would do in your college classes, everything's nice and smooth, and we'll solve it so stochastically so you can see the fluctuations that it can occur. And it's really nice to see it in terms of the michaelis metten reactions, because as you know, there are very few copies of that enzyme substrate complex. So that's the small number guy there, and there can be a lot of fluctuations in that. Uh, we'll also look at the lac genetic switch. We've run that for you already, because it takes a while to run. That's, an, uh, that's a complete RDME. And then we'll also run another reaction diffusion master equation, and that's for the min reaction that leads to simulations, uh, oscillations of these uh, min C and min D in the cell. They are in the cytoplasm and then bind to the membrane. And the way the reaction proceeds is that if you look at the probability of being the midpoint, it's very little. It binds mostly to the sides and to the poles. And this is where the FTSZ can come and start polymerizing and allowing the, the cell to separate. Okay, so those are the tutorials that you'll be seeing. Um, in terms, uh, we'll have then Joe give you a little bit of an explanation of, of uh, setting up the cell simulations and how would you set up, for example, a yeast simulation. So the, there's a little flow diagram that he did uh, of you know, setting up the, the cell simulations. You've got to decide is it going to be uniform, or am I going to take into account different regions of the cell, like a nucleoid, a mitochondria, what? And yes, then I have to add special reactions that are correct for those domains. Um, and then we're bringing in different kinds of solvers here. So like maybe in the future, we'll have it so that, that if you have something that has like you know, millimolar concentrations, you would do that with a standard uh, ODE uh, solver and only use the lattice microbes for the uh, biological processes that involve smaller numbers. All right, so uh, with a look, this is making a yeast cell. Um, what we are planning with VMD is to read directly in, as we did for E. coli, the tomograms. There are now tomograms available for yeast from our collaborators that show you where the nucleus is, the vacuoles, all the mitochondria. But he can show you how to set up a model yeast cell uh, using the <coughs> interfaces to lattice microbes. <coughs> and just to give you a feel for how this runs uh, when you go to, uh, to yeast, here's the number of nodes, so unfortunately you're stuck here, and we won't be having you run yeast because it really does take, is it really too slow? But these are the milliseconds it takes uh, per time step, and that could be you know reaction or diffusion time step. And if you, the more nodes you get, the better the partitioning is between diffusion and reactions and communication. It all becomes about the same here. So if you only have one node, then the reactions are dominating your time, and then as you get more nodes. Uh, is about as fast as you're going to get into a couple um, microseconds, right? Okay, so um, and just to give you 
an example of something we've already run. As I said, tomograms are now available for yeast, so you can try to use those, bring in that information into VMD, and turn it immediately into your cell geometry and start calculating away uh, processes that go on in the cell. Okay, so I think that gives you a little bit of an overview uh, of the lattice microbes. We'd really like to get your feedback of trying this on the, on the cloud, because if that's the case, we might even move all the exercises to there. There's something else that you'll be uh, seeing, and, and I think Joe will explain that. That's the electronic notebook. So we like to have the electronic notebook to go along with the simulation so you know exactly what you set it up, how you set it up, what your concentrations. <coughs> and then when the information comes back, you can use it to plot it, or you can look at the simulations in, um, in VMD. And um, is that going to be straightforward, how to get that into? Yep. yep. <laughs> They're like overly confident back there. Because <laughs> I know damn well you just did that this morning. <laughs> yeah. But I know it works really well. So since you all have VMD up and you have the right VMD here, we were afraid they changed VMD to do this quick MD. And we weren't sure if the newest M VMD would work with the old plug-in for the cell simulation. But it does. We tried it out. So it's OK. All right, all right folks, so any questions on this part? All crystal clear. <laughs> OK. Um, it's already been embedded for you in terms of we have made the kinetic models, right. um, say, for translation. So what we have used for uh, E. coli, if you believe Carl's phylogenetic tree, to a first approximation, those kinetic values would work for almost all the bacteria. Uh, with Jamie Williamson, we did look at a low temperature version. We have a kinetic model for that. But there aren't that many bacteria that we were interested in that were growing at 10 degrees Celsius. Most of them are in that 25 to 40 range. So the, the kinetic model, we will, uh, we've already released it after the Biophysical Journal article. So that is there, right? So these models become available then we, when we get the papers published and it's been peer reviewed, then we make the models available to everybody. Yeah, that's a good question. So yes, you, the first and foremost, you have to reproduce what is experimentally measured. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really uh, talk about that properly, but when we did the comparison, um, well, let me go back here. So well, these experiments um, that we did on the cell colony, those are predictions. Nobody had measured that. In fact, we tried to get a colleague to measure it, and then I had to go hire an experimental postdoc and have him work with my colleagues at the CPLC, and then they went and measured it because we have joint facilities to get, getting the microscope there. So that was a prediction, and that's the validation on the right-hand side. That's the theoretical prediction. That's the validation. The only thing that we heard of afterwards after we published this is, hey, we think this is an, a similar process goes along in tumor cells. That's this lactate cross-feeding. And I just threw this in there because you'd asked about it. And they at least have a patent on that drug. So th that, that metabolic reprogramming takes place, that they're sensitive for where you are. In this case, it's the access to food or to oxygen. In the lactate cross-feeding, it's access to the blood vessels. So again, it's oxygen. and and glucose, right? All right, so that's a prediction. And then even when we did the E. coli, back to these early ones, so uh, 
the fact that there's a different lifetime of it binding that changes with the kinds of cells, uh, that is a prediction, and the, loc uh, the localization of the messenger was also a prediction. That one has been seen. It came out about the same time the experiment as we published it. And so the fast-growing cells, they're the short ones that are two angstrom, so they go from minus one to one. The, the slow-growing cells are the long, skinny guys, and they go, they're about, um, uh, it's one and a half, one, three, three microns long, excuse me. So that, we're still trying to get somebody to measure that. So I talked to Sonny Shi, who did the original experiments, but he said the problem is uh, getting people to go back and repeat something. You know, they want to publish the first new single molecule experiment and go back and prove or disprove a theoretician is not what they cons consider compelling reason to do an experiment. They would rather go off and do something brand new, right? So there are many predictions that go along with that. And we're working now on yeast and one with this, the spliceosome assembly. And we're working very closely with an experimentalist because we take a kinetic model. We can predict how long the assembly, what percentage of the assembly takes place in the cytosol, what part of it takes place in the uh, nucleus. They can knock off the nuclear nucleus localization uh, part of it and see shifts. We can change the rate constant. So uh, there it's really, it's a beautiful uh, collaboration. And we're going, pushing it ahead a little faster and helping them to design the experiments. Because uh, the crystal structure for the spliceosome in yeast just became available this year. So one has an idea of what's critical to do that. So yes, you can do this. Um, you know, you can use these models to make predictions. And I think sometimes what I, my experimental colleagues tell me, particularly like when I showed you the step-by-step -step model of ribosome biogenesis in the cell, it just helps them to think about it. Because they too just concentrate on one aspect of it. And they have trouble thinking about what's all the other stuff that's going on there. And then they see it, and then they come back, and there's a lot more suggestions of things that they'd like to probe. But in, in terms of the integration of the experiments, I feel like the size is important. The proteomics is important. Um, and then everything else ends up being predictions. We can compare some of the kinetics to single molecule if they me measure it. Other things are going to be all predictions. Because they only label one or two things at the most. Right? And there are some experiments now like where you can do two colored. But again, back to that colony simulation, they haven't done the two color experiments yet. You know, uh, except what we did, uh, looking under the structural illumination. Okay. Anything else? I have one more question. Oh, okay. That's so the way. these systems seem incredibly complex, and I can only imagine how long it took to create this model. Um, and I understand that it's kind of ready for us to run in the afternoon session. But um, how can we take this back to our lab? Well, I don't know. Like, it depends um, on what you want to do. To run this full model of ribosome biogenesis, I mean, I would also argue, like, are you going to take back the million atom system that they did on the chromatophore and run it? Yeah, no, you might run the smaller one. So you might start off like we did initially. Here was a kinetic model that we did for uh, a small kinetic model. It's only 25 reactions. Um, you know, you've got an idea, like it, with this model, the main thing we did was we took the tomograms from um, Baumeister. Oh, where is this thing? Just one second here. I think that I have it in the, well, wrong lecture. Uh, <laughs> One second, I've got to find this. Um, 
Maybe it is there. Yeah, somehow this didn't make it into the keynote. So uh, this is what I was telling you about. This is the tomogram that you get, right? So you go, well, I don't have tomograms. Well, OK. But they have been published now, right? So you can put in those ribosomes, right? And then if you want, and, and here's the DNA, and you s more or less know where the origin of the DNA is in E. coli. So I think it's, it's, it's roughly in the middle. Uh, Calobacter, it's at one of the poles, right? So now where's your gene? You tell me where, and let's assume roughly it's linear. So it's going to be somewhere, if you're close to the origin, it's going to be over here. You know, so you place your gene, and then if you want to look at some process, in, including uh, uh, gene expression, that's just the first sets of reactions that we had here, uh, which is where? Uh, okay, let me go one step further since we're here. So this is what I was telling you. Sunny Shi also labeled some of the, prote uh, the proteins on the ribosome, so you could get that distribution. And now what we did is we took the tomograms and the geometry that you see, and here, when you rotate it around for the ribosomes, you can see it is mostly at the poles and the sides, and it's hollow, and that's where you put the DNA. So if you want to be really simple, just say, hey, that's the DNA region. Uh, and, and he'll show you how to design a cell. And you just go, and that's the nucleoid region. And I'm not going to allow certain cells or certain particles to be in there. Or I will have diffusion go through there. So I think once he demonstrates how you set up something even more complicated, it gets to be pretty straightforward how to do that. And then you pack it up with the rest of it. And then you're over here. And now you have this simple model. But this is up to you. You've got to have some model, some kinetics that you're trying to look at in this cell. And then you have them react. But what you try to do is if you think the crowding is important, you can put the crowding in. If you just, I think the size is important, then just even just don't even do a reaction diffusion master equation initially. Just get the volume right and do a CME and look at the reactions that are going on in the cell. And see if it at all agrees, the kinetic model that you've written down agrees with the, uh, any experiments that have been made on those. That you can do very simply. And in fact, before we run anything with the reaction diffusion master equation, particularly with E. coli, to a first approximation, it's a big sack, right? So you try the CME just to see, are we in the right ballpark with the time and the behavior? that some effect is seen, right? Then if it becomes important that, yes, this thing involves you know, motion through the nucleoid region, then we have to put it in there. Or if you have a membrane reaction, oh, that's much different. Then you're really concentrating on just the, the surface part of it, right? You can do that too. So there's lots of ways to do it. It has a Python interface, which I'm told the biologists of any language they learn, Python's it. And I think it's pretty easy to set up. Um, so again, I think uh, as he goes through setting up the, the cell, and as you go through the tutorials, you'll see exactly what rate constants went in there. And then you can take it home and, and give it a whirl. People do teach with this, like at, at other universities. Right? I, uh, much to my surprise, I get emails from these people that are trying it particularly when they teach their biophysics courses. And then if you want to look at the trajectories, there's a plug-in through VMD. Because VMD is designed to know molecules. You have to trick it uh, into uh, these are not atoms. These are representatives of the probability to find things there. Right. So I think you will be able to use it. We're trying to make it more and more user friendly. Um, but right now, the best, the most experience that we can give you is with the, uh, doing E. coli and with doing yeast. Right? If there's something unique about the architecture of Calobacter, we, we're working with the people at Stanford 
to develop that. But I, I don't have the reactions to give out to you. I can't give you the entire translational network for that. Or the, uh, I don't even know how condensed the DNA is all the time in that system. They're trying to give us information on, on ribosome profiling, right? But that's about it. Okay, any, any other comments, questions? So, so try it on the, the cloud. And you'll, I think if you want to purchase some time for your lab, I, you know, you can do the eBay approach to say, I don't want to spend so much money. Ah, oh, there's a node free, cost me five cents, I'm going to try it. And I, I trust me, your students will do it. Right. Okay, anything else? Then maybe lunch or... And then I guess it's back at, is it 2 o'clock? So they'll start with the lectures. And I really do encourage you, as I said, but we only have the, the cloud reserved until 6. They don't take very long to do. I think uh, since we have everything set up, you'll be through the whole thing. Hey, hey, did you time it yet, Joe? It really takes, oh. It takes 2 hours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what you might want to do is one where you just have it well stirred. Those go really fast. Yeah. So the only one that takes time is for you to do this, the min oscillation for the cell division. The, you know, we've cut it down as much as we could, but it still takes about 15, 20 minutes to run. The others go very, very fast, so you could give it a try. And then we've already pre-run the LAC genetic switch for you, so you can just see the results, right? OK? But yeah, you might want to try out the CME part to see what you think. Because it's just like when we teach kinetics in, in school, it's because, like in your chemistry classes, you have a mole of this. You know, you have Avogadro's numbers of everything. You don't have Avogadro's numbers of anything in the cell, you know? So all that stuff that you guys did to get those smooth curves, that's not right, right? <laughs> and you just have to get used to knowing what this chemical master equation is, right? So we should be teaching our chemistry courses a little bit differently. OK, last question. Yeah, I'll just make a box, but to make it realistic, I would at least do the volume. So what's the volume of an E. coli cell? Do you have an idea? Is it a liter? No. No. It's more like a femtoliter. Just do it on the right size box, and you'll get a first good approximation. OK? So volume makes a real difference. Architecture does, too, in these cells. All right.